it feels so wrong. Like, it seems like it's so confusing. Well, I haven't been pressed. Um, I, have, I haven't had an emergency. I, don't, I didn't see anything. But, you know, like it, uh, it didn't happen yeah. once last um, And teaching with a toddler in the room is uh, not a new thing. Okay, so what are we talking about? We are going to talk about extreme points today. This is chapter 4.2. Um, oh, is it this? We're going to talk about like in between the C. Is one of the most is important that? ideas in all yeah, of course. <laughs> extreme points. Or if you really want to, if you really want to, you know, like math it up, you can say extrema. Um, the idea here is a lot of times what you're doing when you model something with an equation in, uh, in where you're going to use calculus on it, you're not actually interested in the function. You're interested in where that function is maximized or minimized, right? So it's a frequent concern in calculus. You're given some function f of x, and you maybe or maybe you don't have a graph of that function. And the idea is you'd really like some way of identifying where these points are. So this and this, they're not absolute maximum for the function or an absolute minimum for the function, but this is what's called a local maximum. And this is what's called a local minimum. And by local, what I mean is if I look in a little window around that point, every other point is below it in height. And if I have, I can find a little window around this one where every other point is above it in height. And if you've ever dealt with computational mathematics, this might seem like the sort of thing that's dead trivial to solve with a computer, and it's absolutely not trivial. Oh. Lost my emphasis there. You might think that this would be the sort of thing that would be trivial to do with a computer, and it turns out to be absolutely not trivial at all to figure out where maxes and mins are. So this, the, a lot of the machinery used to find these things, so you build some function, describing a situation or modeling a situation, and you really want to know where a local max or local min is, there's a lot of machinery that goes into finding those and then making sure that they're the only ones that you haven't missed it. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how to take the machinery that we built last time and use it to study how we find local maxes and local mins for functions in more than one variable. And so I'm going to remind you what we did last time, and then I'm going to write down how it works in one variable and then I'm going to show you what we need to do in, in, uh, in two or more variables. And I'm going to do something that the book doesn't do, which is I'm going to remind you guys what eigenvalues are and describe. So everyone in here is supposed to have seen an eigenvalue at some point. I know that this class has either 206 or 244. Or now, we're not going to be finding eigenvalues, but this is a place where they show up where they really matter. Okay. So it's, it's actually hard to justify. Uh, it's easy to look at eigenvalues when you see them the first time and think, who cares, right? Fine, you can do this to a matrix. But this is a place where they're used in practice. And they make the, the conversation that we're going to have about uh, finding maxes and mins a lot more elegant than the way that the book sets it up. Okay, so what are we up to now? So from last time, this is sort of what we decided. So we defined DF, which is a matrix uh, I'll write it as fx1, fx2, up to fxn. That is the derivative of a function. This is what for a function f, it takes rn into r. The derivative of f is the matrix of partial derivatives. Alternatively, if you want to, you can think about the gradient of f, which is a vector of partial derivatives. For our purposes, what we're doing right now, those are going to be equivalent. And then we defined HF. This was called the Hessian matrix. And HF looked like this. It's a matrix where we take the second derivative, fx1, x1, fx1, x2, up to fxn, sorry, x1, xn. If I go down the rows instead, I change the function I'm taking partial derivatives of. I finally go to fx and fxn. And it's worth noting here that this matrix, if f is C2, remember C2 means second, twice continuously differentiable, right? To be C2 means, uh, if you're C2, it means you are twice. 
continuously differentiable. So this, all the second derivatives exist and they're all continuous, which means all the mixed partials are equal to each other by Clairaut's theorem. If that's the case, this matrix is symmetric. That entry will be equal to that one. Fx one x three will be the same as fx three x one, and so on. Right. So the matrix is equal to its transpose, symmetric matrix. And one of the things you were supposed to have learned was that symmetric matrices can always be diagonalized, or if you like, symmetric matrices always have enough eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Okay. That's going to matter. We're going to I'm going to refer back to that at some point. But for now, just keep in mind that this is a symmetric matrix. So we have a derivative, a notion of an object that measures the first derivative, an object that measures the second derivative, and we decided that the polynomial that approximates f should be given by f of a <coughs> plus df at a times x minus a plus one half of x minus a transpose hf at a x minus a. This is the second degree Taylor polynomial of f. We have the value of the function, the piece that establishes the tangent plane, and the piece that somehow describes the curvature of the function, right? The quadric surface that I showed you guys in the video last time. So this is what the second order Taylor polynomial looks like. Now I did that on the computer. So if there's any questions about that, I would be happy to answer them now. The idea is this was just a convenient notation for something that could have lots and lots and lots of terms, right? Like if there are a 10 variables in your F, there's going to be a hundred partial derivatives to keep track of, second derivatives to keep track of. Much easier to do that with a 10 by 10 matrix than it is to do it with a list of a hundred terms all blown out in some sort of sum. This? Uh, this. Oh, that's HFA. This is H F A times X minus A. Now, before we justify what we're going to do with this, let's remind ourselves how this theory works in one variable. So in one variable, um, we have this theorem. The theorem says that, uh, okay, so first we have a definition. So f prime of x, uh, f prime of a, I should say, a is called a critical point, critical point for a function f from r to r, so a one variable function, if f prime of a is equal to zero. You spent inordinate hours in your life finding critical points of functions, right? Oh, look, a new way to take a derivative. Now go find some critical points, okay? So critical points happen when the derivative is equal to zero and then the condition most people forget or undefined. If the derivative is undefined, we also consider that a critical point. And here's the big theorem about critical points and why you spend so much time studying these things. A local maximum or local minimum can only occur at a critical point. So if I have a local max or a local min, I am guaranteed to have a zero in the derivative there. That's not true in the other direction. Critical points can <laughs> correspond to lots of different function behaviors. But if you had a local max or min, then you occurred at a critical point. So with that, somewhere in your past, you built this chain of ideas called the first and second derivative test, a process for discovering where a function has local maxes and mins. And it went like this. Step one. Find all the critical points. By solving f prime of x is equal to zero. Step two. Test those points 
for concavity using the second derivative. If you were in this case, well, you must have been concave up, right? Local mat minimums occur when a function is concave up. So if f prime prime of your critical point was positive, you're a minimum. If f prime prime of your critical point was negative, well, that, that corresponds to this situation. So downward concavity at a critical point means you must have been a maximum. What can we say if f prime prime of a is equal to zero? You are the inflection point. Okay, so possibly an inflection point. So for example, if you look at the function f of x is equal to x cubed, and you look at the graph of that, it comes in, it has derivative equal to zero and second derivative equal to zero, zero, and it changes concavity. So for this function, we have an inflection point of zero. So it's possible that you could have neither. Or you could have a maximum, or you could have a minimum, because you could consider this function. Sharp points would do it, so that's where the derivative is undefined, but not even that. Look at this function. Can you use the second derivative test to conclude that thing has a minimum of zero? The answer is no, you can't. It's too flat. Because it has a critical point there, right? So you take the derivative and you get 4x to the third, and that has a critical point at x is equal to zero because the derivative is zero there. But then you test it with a second derivative test. Okay, so f prime, that's step one. Step two, f prime prime of x is six x squared, but f prime prime of zero is zero. I can't say anything. This actually has a minimum there. And the reason I call it sort of too flat is because it kind of squished U looking shape. It's like a parabola of a crushed down more because it's, it's a fourth degree function. So it's too flat to, for the second derivative test to figure out what's happening. Okay. So this is what's called the ambiguous case. If the second derivative test spits out a zero, you just fail. There's nothing to be done. You've got to do some other analysis to figure out what's happening in a function. Okay. So there's three cases for the second derivative. You plug critical points in, then you decide, okay, well, I'm either a minimum or I'm a maximum, or I can't say anything at all. I've got to do more math. So what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to lift up our ideas that we used uh, to develop these sort of second order approximations. Maybe we can figure out a way not to use f prime, but we can use df right here, something derived from df, right? Maybe we can get critical points by saying that this derivative is equal to zero. Maybe we're going to be able to study concavity, like the way that this function bends in multiple directions, by looking at some sort of property associated with hf. So the role of the first derivative is going to be played with, uh, the, the role of f prime is going to be played by df in our n variable version of this. And the role of the second derivative, our concavity measuring uh, thing, is going to be this matrix of derivatives instead. And so there's going to be some machinery that we need, we need to use to look at that. Okay, we, those of you that took 241 recently probably remember a really dumb thing called the D test to figure out if this matrix represents a maximum or minimum, but it only works in two variables. And it's, uh, I'm gonna, I'll point it out when we get there. Um, but don't, don't get too attached to that idea. If for whatever reason that rung a bell, right? Taking like examining this matrix of second derivatives rung a bell, we're gonna work around that. Okay, so the sort of things that we wanna be able to analyze look like this. So the function f of x, y is equal to x squared minus y squared. The first thing I'm going to do when I look at this is I'm going to make a definition that says, I'm going to say that I'm looking at, just as in one variable, it turns out to be the case that we can define the notion of a critical point of f. And a critical point of f happens not when the, set, when the first derivative is equal to 0, 
but when df of x is equal to zero. And this is a matrix being equal to zero, and a matrix is equal to zero when each entry is equal to zero. So critical points for a two variable function or more happen when the matrix of partial derivatives has zeros in each entry. And that means we're going to have systems of equations to solve to find critical points. So in this particular example, uh, fx is equal to 2x, and fy is equal to minus 2y, so it's being up there. And the only way I can have a critical point is if both of those equations are equal to zero simultaneously. This matrix has to be zero, which means both of these equations have to be equal to zero at the same time. Well, the first equation can hold when x is equal to, you know, this will be equal to zero, f of x is equal to zero, when 2x is equal to zero, which means x is equal to zero. Notice that says nothing about the y values of the critical point. It just says whatever your points are, if the x coordinate was zero, then this derivative would be zero. So the x coordinate of your point must be zero. This equation says that the y coordinate of your point must also be zero. So how many critical points does this incredibly interesting function have? Well, just one. If the x coordinate has to be zero and also the y coordinate has to be zero, there's precisely one point that makes that true. Okay. So that would tell you that the critical point for this function occurs at zero, zero. As in the one variable case, we have absolutely no idea what kind of critical point that is. Now, if you're good at drawing things in three dimensions, you actually might take a stab at this point. So one way to say, I don't know what kind of critical point that is. Maybe, maybe it's a local minimum, right? So it sits at the bottom of some kind of paraboloid looking thing. Or maybe it's a local maximum. Could anything else happen? So you draw that function and you get this sort of shape out the other side. So it kind of goes like this, and then comes down here. And then it goes this way, and then it comes down like this, and then it's travel in the back, and it comes across like this. And the point that we're interested in is right here. So you draw it. This is the point corresponding to zero, zero, right? So zero, zero, zero is on the graph. This is the critical point. But notice it's neither a maximum nor a minimum, because if I move in this direction away from the point, I go up in height. If I go out along that parabola, I increase in height, which makes me think I'm at a minimum. But if I go in the other direction, I go down the surface instead. So in this direction, it opens up. In the other direction, it goes down. So this is neither a maximum nor a minimum. And maybe some point uh, you know, in the previous class, I hope you guys have come across the term saddle point before. So the saddle point is a point that's neither a maximum nor a minimum. In some directions, the surface goes up. In some directions, the surface goes down. And so what I want to do is I want to start trying to write down a way of recording some quantity I can study that captures the notion that in some direction, for something like this, in some directions I go up, in some direction I go down. I'd like to have a notion that captures the idea of being a local max or captures the idea of being a local min. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to use this. Remember, this is called the differential. Of F which is also change in height. Okay. So what the differential is going to get us is a way of examining what's happening as I move in different directions. So you can imagine if you took delta F here and you evaluated it near zero, zero, but for little tiny changes in H and K, where you let H and K wiggle around in whatever way you wanted, what you would be saying is, if you moved around in the x coordinate, does the height, but left this alone, if you just moved around in that direction, does the height go up or down? Well, if you moved in the x direction, I guess I have to tell you what the x direction is. This is the x direction over here, x. Let's say this is the y direction coming up this way. 
If I slide around in the x direction, the differential goes up. Change in the height of the surface is positive. So in the x direction, small changes increase uh, f, the height of f, which means that the change in f is a positive number. In one direction, change in my height is positive. But in the y direction, if I slide the k variable around here, I move just the itty bitty wiggles in the y direction, what happens is this uh, instead curves down instead, right? In the y direction, small changes decrease. Small changes decrease f, they decrease the height. And that means that the change in height is a negative number. So in some directions, we increase the height. And in other directions, we decrease the height. That actually turns out to be exactly how we characterize what it means to be a saddle point. In some directions, we go up. In other directions, we go down. This is easy to show you guys in two dimensions, and it's very hard to imagine what's going on in like n dimensions. But the same idea applies. What's up? You're basing that off of. So I I'm, I haven't told you how to work. The f x f y gave us where the critical point was, but nothing else. This only tells us where this happened. How do I know this is going on? Because I'm looking at the picture. I haven't given you a concrete way of actually. What we're going to do is. This is easy for me to wave my hands at because I drew a picture and I'm saying, look, as you go this way, you go up. And as you go this way, you go down. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the study of this, of this delta F, and I'm going to turn it into the study of the Hessian matrix. That's what we're going to do. Okay. So I really like to be able to study this object right here. But man, this is a nightmare to work with. This is a nightmare to work with because if I actually computed it, I'm going to get h squared minus k squared. And then I have to say, oh, for all possible values of h and k that are close to zero, is this thing positive or negative? Well, and some changes are positive and some changes are negative. And the algebra needed to analyze this thing is a nightmare. This is delta f for that function at zero, zero. But it's too hard to analyze. So delta F is the thing that I want to use to measure if I'm at a max or a min, but I can't do it this way. I mean, there's going to be, especially if you imagine there's 10 input variables, am I going to be able to draw a 10-dimensional saddle point? No. If you guys manage to even be able to visualize what a four-dimensional saddle point looks like, I'll be impressed. I have no idea how to do that. Some people claim they can visualize things in, in four dimensions, but uh, that means Okay, so how, how are we going to get a handle on, on, on how to do this? Um, and the answer is we're going to make the following observation. So we want to be able to make this definition that says, uh, we want to be able to say that if delta f, if, if we're at the point A, and we define delta f to be equal to f of x minus f of A, so this is, I mean, this is, this would measure change in F, right? There's your anchor point. There's a slight movement away from A. Did your height go up or down? This is a measure of what you did between A and X. How much did your height change? Um, if we define Delta F this way, if Delta F is positive for all X near A, we're at, let's see, so, Change in, if I'm at A, and no matter what direction I go, my change in height is positive. I must be at a minimum value in that case, right? Mm -hmm. and I don't, if I move in any direction, but my height goes up, I'm at a local minimum. And if delta F is negative for all X near A, then my local maximum. And if I'm in the unfortunate case of having delta F be equal to zero in any direction, uh, if, let's say if, if delta F has negative and positive values, has negative 
and positive value. Near A. That's this case. You're at a saddle point. A is a saddle point. And the final case is if delta f is equal to zero in some direction, then you have no idea what that is. Right? So the ambiguous case still holds. Damn, I haven't actually fixed the problem because I told you delta f was too hard to work with. So now this is where we're going to lump in some. Uh, yep. So, uh, in the case of like variable functions, we were kind of like looking at a small interval. Uh, so yeah. Would be like a small, small circle. Yeah. So when I say x near a right here, so there's a bunch of language that got used um, in the early part of the book where I told you we weren't going to work with the epsilons and deltas. If you guys are taking analysis at all, what we mean here is a neighborhood of a, which just means a tiny ball around a, right? All the vectors in some sphere around A, all the x's and the, all the values in sort of some sort of little uniform, like little uniform interval or little neighborhood ball or circle. If it's if this is true, then that's what we mean by near A, right? So in two variables, what we mean is if you were at some function or you got some point A, then you could find a little circle around A where for every value in that circle, the height change was positive. That would mean that you were at a local minimum. It means any direction you go, the function is headed up. Right? So this is kind of hand wavy stuff because since proof is not a prerequisite for this class, when I say near A, I want you to think for all values, for all inputs that are in, like within some very small fixed distance of A, we have uniform property. Basically, any direction you move from A, the function goes up. Okay. So how am I going to get the Hessian into the mix? So if delta f is equal to f of x minus f of a, but f of x is approximately equal to p2 of x near a. So this thing is the second degree Taylor polynomial. And that means that f of x is approximately equal to f of a plus df a x minus a plus one half of x minus a transpose h f at a times x minus a. Wait a second. If I'm at a critical point, what's this term equal to? Why? Because the derivative is zero, right? If, the, if we're at a critical point, this term isn't here because df is zero. That's what it means to be at a critical point. At a critical point, df at a is zero, which means that term isn't there. But at a critical point, that term's not there. And what happens to the f of a term? Well, there's a minus f of a right here. So what we can do is we can say, well, as long as we're near a, the change in f is about equal to f of a plus one half x minus a transpose hf at a times x minus a, but then minus f of a. So this minus f of a is still here, but then the f of a is canceled. And so it turns out to be the case that this thing that I want to work with, that I've defined what it means to be a local max or a local minimum, turns out to be approximately equal to this. So using the second order Taylor expansion means that I can study the changes and how f moves away from a point by not looking at the whole function, but just approximating it with this. And this is an example of something where I can study how this thing behaves just by looking at this matrix. This is a numerical matrix. It's full of numbers that tell you how the fun, how the surface is curving. Yep. 
So this is, oh, I'm sorry, I should have put the transpo right here. Yeah, so this actually, the, if you guys have seen linear algebra, this is really secretly an inner product. This is the dot product of two vectors. This, in physics, you would have seen this as a sort of like um, uh, the Brock hat notation, right? Yeah. This is an operator applied to a vector. And in the second slot, you hit it with this transpose vector, which turns into a scalar. This is really secretly a scalar product. So all of this crap in the middle here is a dot product of two vectors. It doesn't look like it. I don't really want to get into the theory of it, but that's what's going on here. So this is, this is a quadratic form. So this thing really can be thought of as equal to the dot product of HF at A um, times the vector X minus A dotted with the vector X minus A. And that quantity will be positive. That basically means that instead of studying this thing, I can actually just look at the, I'm going to say eigenvalues now. Let's skip it. But if I have something in this form, and so Jack, a good question. This is called a quadratic form. It's not really in the scope of the class to talk about the theory of quadratic forms, but anything that can be written in the form vector, transpose, matrix, vector is called a quadratic form. And to say that something is positive, if I want to say that something of that form, you should recognize that's what this is, right? It's a matrix in the middle, a transpose vector in the front, a transpose vector on the end. Um, this thing, if there's a function running around here, this that will be positive whenever the matrix in the middle has positive eigenvalues. So there's a deep connection here to uh, linear, um, linear algebra. So I'm gonna I'm gonna wave my hands a little bit this because it's important to know that this move is justified. I'm saying that the way that the surface moves can be estimated by a sum that look by a, by a product that looks like this. So what we're saying is the way that the surface changes can be thought of as about equal to one half times x minus a transpose h f a times x minus a. And what I'm saying is. This thing right here, this will always be positive if that matrix only has positive eigenvalues. And it will always be negative if that matrix always has negative eigenvalues. And if it has mixtures of positive and negative eigenvalues, it will correspond to saddle points with this thing. Sometimes positive, sometimes negative. So this is a quadratic form. And what it means is that this thing will be positive. So all of this stuff, um, maybe I'll call this stuff. Stuff will be positive. Uh, stuff is positive if and only if HFA is a positive definite matrix. So I'm using this language because it will come up in other classes, not because we're going to delve into the theory of it, but by positive definite, a matrix is positive definite means HF of A has only positive eigenvalues. You didn't think you learned all that linear algebra for nothing. So this thing that we're using to approximate the way the surface will bend will be positive in every direction whenever this matrix has only positive eigenvalues. So the study of the way the function moves turns into the study of this matrix. This is why the Hessian is powerful. On the other hand, the stuff, that's a bad movie, by the way, it's a stuff, if you've never seen it, it's an ancient monster movie from the 70s where people eat something like Oreo cookie filling. It's, like, it's, whole, like, it's kind of like the blob, except you turn into the blob after you eat the, you know, the stuff. Um, anyway, so the stuff will be negative this quantity that we're using to approximate delta f. So I guess we should put this in. The idea here is that delta f will be positive because it's approximately equal to this. So delta f is positive whenever the Hessian is positive definite. The differential will be negative whenever the stuff is negative, which is the same as h, f, and a being um, a negative definite. And that corresponds to HF of A having only negative eigenvalues. And then there's the mixed case. 
this thing will take on positive and negative values if the eigenvalues are positive and negative, are mixtures of positive and negative. So what you can say is, if so delta F will be positive and negative, positive and negative, if H F A has positive and negative eigenvalue. And then there's the ambiguous case. Notice nowhere in here did I allow zero to be an eigenvalue. So remember in one variable, in one variable, the ambiguous case happens when the second derivative is equal to zero and you can say nothing, right? The second derivative is equal to zero, it says it could be an inflection point, or you could be a really squashed minimum, or you could be a really squashed maximum. So the same thing happens here. If H F of A has zero as an eigenvalue, then uh, it's, it's indeterminate. You can't actually tell if it's a maximum or a min or a cell point. This is going to correspond to, let's see, all positive eigenvalues means the function goes up. This is all describing the case where you have a local minimum value. If the matrix all has negative eigenvalues, it means you go down in every direction. That corresponds to being a maximum. Yep. If you are positive and negative, depending on the direction you go, that is the matrix has positive and negative eigenvalues, you're at a saddle point. Does it say on? Uh, has uh, if has zero as an eigenvalue. If f if h f a has zero as an eigenvalue, then you're indeterminate, which means you can't tell if it's positive or if it's maximum. You can't classify. Which means more sophisticated techniques are needed. I was going to ask if like you can think of like the x a like vector right as your path and then it's just the Hessian of all these derivatives like keep containing kind of like the torsion and rotation and like acceleration on that path. Essentially yeah but you have to but it's but it's keeping track of all possible paths at the same time. Yeah. 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 Right. So if that's what you think about what the surface is actually measuring. Yeah. Then yeah. So the other thing is you might think about what role the eigenvectors that you probably learned about play in here. The eigenvectors actually tell you what the vectors of greatest increase and decrease are for the function, right? So it's actually describing the axis on which the increase or decrease is happening. Yep. Um, if eigenvalues are complex or corresponding. Ah. To okay. Yeah. That's an absolutely beautiful question. What happens if there's complex eigenvalues? So one of the biggest, deepest theorems of undergraduate linear algebra is that symmetric matrices have real eigenvalues. Symmetric matrices. Symmetric matrices. Hermitian means conjugate symmetric. Yeah. Symmetric matrices have, although the same theorem holds, yeah. have real eigenvalues. So if the matrix is symmetric, there can't be complex eigenvalues. Okay, so there won't be. There just won't be complex eigenvalues. In the, in the, so we, if we deal with C two functions, we don't have that. But yes, rotation is really what's going on in the background. Okay. So that's a lot of words. We haven't really done a lot of examples yet. Um, let me show you the way that this shows up in 241 when you learn this the first time. And then I'm going to hook this into the way Kali described what's going on here. So I'm trying to set up the theoretical machinery before we go into how you actually compute with this, because I do not want you to do these questions the way Kali wants you to do them. She wants you to do them with stacked determinants of minors, which I think is the worst possible way of doing this. I'll explain why when we get there. Okay. Um, I don't want you doing piles of determinants to figure things out. I want you to go to a computer and put a matrix into it and find the eigenvalues. That's what I want. Nobody ever does this by hand. You get a matrix, you put it in a Wolfram Alpha, it tells you what the eigenvalues are. You tell me what kind of point you're at. Okay? Professor? Yes. Uh, I think I missed this point, but can you explain why eigenvalues can be 
like what the connection so the connection is any form that looks like this if you have a matrix a times a vector and you hit it with another vector i'm going to use this symbol but what I, all i mean is if you have a a v dot v where v is a v is a is a is a variable in fact let's write like this if you have a dot product looks like this a x dot product with x so first i take the matrix a and i apply it to x and then i take a dot with a so another way of writing that is like this That's the same thing. This thing will be positive for all values of x if the matrix has positive eigenvalues. So we're saying delta f is about equal to whatever comes out of this thing. I want to know when delta f is, if delta f is always positive. Well, delta f always being positive would mean that this is always positive. And that's always positive whenever A is positive. And when I say A is positive, I mean A has positive eigenvalues. So this is a basic piece of the interaction between functions and linear algebra, is that if you have one of these things, which is called a quadratic form, it will be positive if the matrix is positive. And it will be negative if the matrix is negative. So if delta F is going to be negative, that's the same thing as saying AX dot X is negative. And that's the same thing as saying A is negative, but that means A has negative eigenvalue. It's just a you can actually just show that this must be true. Yep. You ever use not standard product in anything? Non-standard in your product? Oh yeah, well, I do, man. I'm a function theorist in infinite dimensional function spaces. My life is built out of non-standard <laughs> products. So, like, we mean the Euclidean inner product here. Right? I know. But like, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I could define all kinds of things that are inner products. My favorite inner product is the trace inner product, which is you take two matrices and you take their traces, and then you know, like, there's a way of getting that the tr the trace of a matrix is the sum of the diagonal elements. Mm -hmm. There's a way of defining an inner product where you, you actually do that. Take a matrix, add up all diagonal elements, and then you can define a scalar product using that. That is an inner product, but absolutely not the one that you're used to. So yeah, inner products exist on infinite dimensional vector spaces too. Uh, here, I'm gonna drift temporarily into a very, so I cannot resist answering this question. <laughs> okay, so this idea still works uh, in vector spaces, but not just Euclidean vector spaces like we're setting up here. I don't know if anybody in here has ever thought of, uh, has ever come across the idea of L2. L2 is the set of functions that have the property. Um, so it's functions with the integral of the absolute value of f squared bounded. So no asymptotes, basically. Right? Or if the asymptotes are, are, you know, this is like the core. This is the single most important family of functions in the entire world. All of engineering is built out of L2, basically, right? In fact, if you've ever in your life computed a root mean square, you're working in L2. Right? So this is the language of, of uh, electricity. It's the language of mechanical systems where you compute power with a root mean square average. You're working in what's called the L2 norm. So what is the inner product in L2? F dot G is equal to the integral of F times complex times root two. That's a dot product. Doesn't look like one, but it acts exactly like you putting in background. So this same machinery works in that vector. You still have the notion of, of positive definite. Mm -hmm. So you can still set up the idea of what it means to be a matrix in this space, which is an infinite dimensional object instead. But yeah, this this uh, all these ideas work over here. And so if, what that means is, if you guys have ever exhaustively gone through this computation, you poor bastards, <laughs> if you've ever shown that this integral is equal to zero, most of you that have ever, a lot of you will have shown that any integral of this form is equal to zero or even worse, this one. Right? These are, and if you haven't had the pleasure of working your way through showing that these integrals are equal to zero, because you haven't taken linear analysis two or signals or vibrations or anything where you actually have to work with Fourier series, which is what these are built out of. Um, Somebody like me, who's an infinite dimensional vector space person, would say, well, these are an orthogonal basis for L2. And so all you've really written down with all your horrendous algebra and calculus is the fact that the cosine of mx dot the cosine 
of nx is equal to zero because they're orthogonal to each other, right? So this defines a dot product. It actually lets you solve some really interesting, complicated integrals that you need for working with Fourier series. So the fact you've got a dot product means you've got a notion of angle. Two things are orthogonal if they're dotted zero. Okay. If you had more time in this class, lifting all the stuff we're doing up to infinite dimensions would be awesome. But unfortunately, we can't do that. Anyway, it turns out that the eigenvalues of things are really important and they describe how operations on vector spaces act. Okay, you're interested in L2 theory. Yeah, infinite dimensional linear algebra is awesome. Okay, so how did this show up when you saw it in 241 if you took 241? Like if you, I, possibly you did not take it because you came in from a different university or you took it from a new college or something. What you would have learned is this. If you have a function f of x, y, you learn that, okay, so you find critical points by doing this. You take df dx and you set it equal to zero, and you take df dy and you set it equal to zero, and any x, y that satisfies that is a critical point. They didn't even tell you about df. They just said, do that. Okay, this is used to find the critical points. Oh, my battery's running low. Okay, um, then what do you do? Then you compute this thing where you write this down. Oh, I don't know, f, x, x, f, uh, y, y, minus f of x, y squared. And then you call this object D, right? And then you say, oh, well, the study of maxes and mins comes down to studying when that, that thing is positive or negative. And so you have this whole theorem that said, oh, if D is positive, then you're at a minimum value. And if D is negative, then you're at a maximum value. And if D is uh, uh, zero, then you can say nothing. And then there were some sub cases where, like, if D was equal to zero and F X Y was bigger than F X X, then you were to, you know, there's all sort of extra conditions involved here. I'm not even telling you the whole theorem. It's dumb, right? What are you really doing when you do this? This is the determinant of the matrix F X X, F X Y, F Y X, F Y Y. It's the determinant of that matrix. What does the determinant of a matrix 